April 1945, Captain Steve Rogers and James Buchanan Barnes attempt to stop Baron Zemo's experimental drone plane with a bomb that could turn the tide of war in favor of the Nazis. While Barnes survives the ordeal, becoming the mind-controlled secret assassin in the employee of Russia, Steve Rogers is presumed dead. Professor Eric Schmidt, inventor of a super soldier process similar to Dr. Abraham Erskine's process responsible for Captain America, supposed that, provided his work was similar to Erskine's, Rogers might have survived, thanks to the super soldier serum. This conjecture would never be proven, as Roger's body would never be found. The legend of Captain America was kept alive through William Nasland and Fred Davis, enlisted to operate as Captain America and his partner Bucky. One year after Roger's death, the all winner squad was formed. One of the team's earliest missions saw them face off against Adam II, a mad android seeking to assassinate a Boston congressional candidate. This mission would see the death of Nasland and the team's failure to stop the rogue android from killing the senator, though they were able to foil the android's attempt to replace him. Although Captain America would live on, the the newfound team was disheartened by their failure and soon went their separate ways. Had the senator survived, he might have gone on to become president of the United States, pushing the nation forward in the space race against the Soviet Union. But with the death of John F. Kennedy, the nation didn't have that drive, pushing it forward in this initiative. Reed Richards wouldn't convince his friends to join him in stealing a rocket to go to the stars. Never receiving powers from this fated flight, Jonathan Storm wouldn't discover a homeless man in Lower Manhattan was an amnesiac Namor, the Submariner. Never shaken from his memory loss, Namor would never discovered the frozen Steve Rogers, precipitating the recovery of the fallen icon. The Fantastic Four never traveled to ancient Egypt during the reign of the time-traveling pharaoh Rama Tut. Without the Fantastic Four fighting Rama Tut in the inner courts, the pharaoh's warlord Ozymandias had nothing to distract him from attempting to kill the young mutant Insabanir. Insabanir killed Ozymandias, igniting a civil war among those who followed Ozymandias and those who saw the young mutant as a god. Insabanir reluctantly joined forces with Rama Tut, long enough to eradicate most of Ozymandias' loyal followers, sending the survivors into the very deserts that had forged nearer into Ramatut's new warlord. Though Insabanir had been weaned on hatred against Ramatut, it was Ozymandias who was responsible for the slaughter of Insabanir's tribe. With Ozymandias dead, Nir found he had much he could learn from the pharaoh. Both Ramatut and Insabanir thought they were using the other until their partner in arms would no longer prove useful. But it was a threat from without that brought down this dynasty. Ramatut's illegitimate son, Ramadis, had marshaled what was left of Ozymandias' loyalists and formed a rebellion. Joining Ramadis were many who feared and hated what Insabanir was and didn't care to see him take the throne after Ramatut's passing. Distracted by the uprising, Ramatut's new warlord was taken by surprise in an attack by Ramadis. By now, Insabanir was familiar with Ramatut's technology and stole away to allow the futuristic wonders to heal him. Ramatut was abandoned with no way to access his advanced weaponry that could have saved him from his enraged son. With the pharaoh dispatched, Ramadis took the throne, becoming a well-loved ruler. Ramatut's healing chamber might have malfunctioned, or perhaps the arrogant warlord wasn't as familiar with the futuristic device as he thought for he slumbered for centuries and was absent when the alien brood invaded Earth during the reign of Kasakimwe Kasakimwe. Imhotep, a warrior who might have ascended to the throne after acting as a shield against the creatures, fought along with the avatar of the god Khonshu against the beasts. Their efforts only barely kept the monsters at bay. This war lasted years and attracted the attention of a millennia-old slayer of monsters, Ulysses Bloodstone. Even with the aid of the barbarian Northmen, Imhotep saw the war could still rage for the rest of his life and made a pact with the brood, ending the hostilities. Though the war was over this outraged Bloodstone, who betrayed Imhotep after all had laid down their arms. Imhotep's brotherhood drove away Bloodstone, who would remain an enemy of the Brotherhood of the Shield. While forming alliances with inhuman entities started as a pragmatic means of ending a war, it soon became the modus operandi of the Brotherhood. This organization sought to protect their world from any number of threats, and saw they couldn't devote themselves to this cause, with Ulysses Bloodstone dedicated to putting an end to the Brotherhood that would ally itself with monsters he sought to destroy. While bringing inhuman creatures into their ranks started as a necessity to protect against Bloodstone's wrath, it soon became apparent harnessing these creatures that otherwise posed a threat to their world was an ingenious way of bolstering their ranks. If the shield convinces the Tricephalus to join them, that might scare Giganto into joining the humans to protect itself from their monstrous allies. Unfortunately, Ulysses Bloodstone was also capable of forging unholy alliances, and soon came in contact with another immortal, Selene Galeo, a sort of vampiric mutant who, if the shield's records are to be believed, was even older than Bloodstone, several thousand years old by the time time his feud with the shield began. Selene's longevity came from draining the life essence from others, a practice she discovered she no longer needed to continue when in the presence of the alien gem on Bloodstone's chest. The ruby that kept Bloodstone youthful did the same for the Dark Mutant, who kept the angry monster hunter in her good graces by directing him toward those she convinced him were a threat. Despite the feud between Bloodstone and the shield, both factions found themselves at odds with a common foe, the ancient Gaborum that had menaced humanity over 2,000 years before the reign of Ramatut. Even the records of the Brotherhood of the Shield are incomplete 
incomplete when it comes to how the Gaborim were defeated millennia earlier, though it might have been the intervention of other gods, possibly seeing the Gaborim's actions as interference in the realm that they saw as their own. Agents of the Shield and Bloodstone both came in contact with the mighty Gaborim, seeking allies against their enemy factions, and both realizing the Gaborim were incompatible with their ultimate desires of protecting Earth. Even Cunning Selene assisted her pawn, as well as an ally to the Shield, the Sorcerer Supreme Ashake, student of the Elder God Ashur, who had assisted Bloodstone and Imhotep in the war against the Brood, though her presence in these years of war was sporadic, likely due to Ashur sending her elsewhere, when her aid might have ended the war much sooner. With the Gaborim sealed away, Bloodstone promised this alliance changed nothing in the Monster Slayer's war against those who sought peace with his prey. It would be centuries before Bloodstone would realize he was being used to eliminate not Agents of the Shield, but Selene's own enemies. By this time, Selene had discovered a similar gem to the one embedded in Ulysses' Bloodstone, not far from the Fields of Blood, where war with the Brood had ended. Taking this stone, which incomplete shield records called the Cost Stone, Selene Galeo seemingly disappeared from human history, though there were spurious reports she discovered a living island populated with mutants like herself, and with the Cost Stone giving her the immortality she had spilled so much blood to achieve, she eventually became a queen to these mutants of legend. When Insabanir finally emerged from Ramatut's healing chamber near the end of Ramses II's reign, it was to a very different world. The former warlord had little interest in the conflict between Bloodstone and the Brotherhood of the Shield, and sought to re-establish his position of power he held before his long slumber. Although much had changed in the mutants' long sleep, court intrigue and betrayals had not. There was much amiss following the death of Ramses II and the rise of the new pharaoh, Meriptah. Not long before Ramses II died, one of the court sorcerers, Nefut Shah, convinced his pharaoh to banish another sorcerer, Anoth Namat, removing what he thought was the only obstacle to becoming the power behind the throne. Nefut Shah wasted no time putting in place a scheme where he could save the young pharaoh's life from a danger he was the architect of in order to ingratiate himself to the new pharaoh. Unfortunately, Nefut Shah did not foresee the coming of Insabanur, who saved Meriptah from Nefut Shah's scheme, unintentionally befriending the new pharaoh. Although Ramatut had abolished polytheism during his reign, the abundance of sorcery at this time was not Insabanur's first encounter with the supernatural. In what he thought was a hallucination at the time, he had been blessed by the goddess Isis before his partnership with Ramatut. It was this brief brush with the supernatural that had aroused the curiosity of the Sorcerer Supreme Ashake, still alive centuries after the war with the Brood. Though Ashake's loyalty to her homeland had never faltered, her affiliation with the Brotherhood of the Shield and the various missions her patron goddess Ashtur sent her on had caused her to fall in the eyes of the pharaohs for some generations. The secular leaders felt they could not trust their protector because of what appeared to be divided loyalties. And the latest avatar of the moon god Khonshu, a firstborn son, had recently died during the reign of Ramses II. And with Nefut Shah's rival at court vanished, Ashake felt she had nowhere else to turn, so she awakened Insabanir from his sleep. Though even with Insabanir saving the pharaoh's life, it would be difficult for the mutant to expose the corruption of Nefut Shah, as the sorcerer had loyally served Meriptah's father. Insabanir became Meriptah's chief general, strengthening the new pharaoh's reign in a time of instability. While the mutant kept an eye on Nefut Shah, he soon found an ally in another sorcerer, Hekanut, the young pupil to the banished Anath Namut. During the unlikely pair's vigilance, Insabanir's bitterness faded. Though it would be too kind to say he encountered no distrust or hatred from those he met in his new life, his friendship with the young pharaoh was genuine, and perhaps the work the Brotherhood of the Shield had done, by now expanded across the known world, had allowed the general public to become more accepting of something unknown like Insabanur. This, as well as his curiosity about the young Hekanut's studies, gave Insabanur a new lease on life. By the time Insabanur and Hekanut exposed Nefut Shah for what he was, the mutant was unhappy with his old dreams of conquest, but was unsure how he should dedicate his life. It was Ashake who suggested Insabanur could become the next agent of Khonshu. Ashake convinced Khonshu a long-lived agent might be more prudent than empowering short-lived mortals who might resist the word of the gods. As Insabanur had already been blessed by the gods, he might be an easier student to train and act with the authority of Khonshu in earthly matters. Khonshu and Insabanur were agreeable, and Insabanur amicably parted ways with the pharaoh, leaving Hekanut as the new court sorcerer. Ashake also sought a change in her life. Since Anoth Namut's exile, Ashake had taken him on as her new disciple, hoping to bestow on him the title of Sorcerer Supreme, allowing her to retire in the near future to live out the rest of her days in peace, perhaps starting the family she always wanted. And that's it for this video. This crazy idea has mutated and warped since the seed for it first germinated in my brain, and I ended up doing a lot of research, most of which didn't even manifest itself in this video. So this will almost certainly be a multi-part what-if thing. I'm not even sure what shape it will take as I move forward. I've said before, I'm not a big fan of what-if. Usually you have your moment of divergence from the main Marvel Universe, 
universe. Then in 22 pages, they try to cram in an entire universe getting destroyed all because Matt Murdock didn't get blinded when he was a kid or whatever. So while I normally am not a fan of this kind of thing, giving a concept like this as much room as it needs to unfold is exactly what I have always wanted with What If and very rarely get. So expect more from this weird alternate Marvel universe. Not sure when, but until then, have a good one.